Welcome back, everybody! Let's do the thing that's not a review that I sometimes do when I tell you all about a book that y'all should read, or maybe three books in this case. And yes, today I want to talk about um, the Marid Odran trilogy by George Alec Effinger. Um, the books are When Gravity Fails, <laughs> A Fire in the Sun, and The Exile Kiss. Um, they're written somewhere between 1986 and 91. And uh, they are what you might call cyberpunk. So yeah, let's do that, shall we? Cheers. <laughs> Alright, so what we're going to do is talk a bit about cyberpunk, uh, then I'll give a bit of a synopsis of what you can expect from these books, and then we'll do our usual spoiler break, and then we talk about some of the aspects of these three novels that I think are remarkable and make them stand out as works of cyberpunk literature that should get more attention than they're getting currently, which, you know, <laughs> is probably just some attention because it feels like no one talks about these books anymore, which I think is a shame. So, um, let's talk about cyberpunk first, and then talk about this strategy. So, obviously, y'all know what cyberpunk is, right? You spend hours and hours cursing that video game that came out last year, and um, maybe even played it by now. I don't know. <laughs> I certainly haven't, but that's no big surprise. So, um, some of you probably already know that Cyberpunk 2077, seven, whatever, that game is based on a tabletop role-playing game called Cyberpunk 2020, and, and Cyberpunk 2030, and so forth, depending on which edition you're looking at. And uh, as it happens, that 2020, Cyberpunk 2020 game from Telsorian Games, or Telsorian Games, had actually a source book called When Gravity Fails. Um, so there's connections here that we'll talk about maybe later, but probably not. Um, but yeah, so Cyberpunk is a very, was a very, very 1980s um, subgenre of science fiction that has become somewhat retro nostalgia based at this point and has not aged too well for a bunch of reasons. And I guess part of the appeal of that new computer game last year, that, once again, I haven't played, is its retro appeal, right? It's that nostalgia. It looks like 80s. It, it feels like 80s. It does a lot of the 80s things. Okay, so let's have a quick look at like what Cyberpunk does, why Cyberpunk was so powerful then, and why it maybe didn't age too well. And then we'll talk about whether... Marido Dran has maybe aged better than, say, Case and Molly and the others from William Gibson's Neuromancer and the other Sprawl books and um, so forth. So, Cyberpunk is, as I said, a uniquely 1980s kind of thing. It came after your classic sci-fi era, your hard sci-fi and all of that, and took in elements of the punk movement of the times, a critical approach towards, you know, capitalism, towards authority, all these things blended into cyberpunk with a radical change in style as well, which you can see when you go and read, say, you know, the works of William Gibson, who is sort of the one that usually gets cited when you talk about cyberpunk. I mean, there's obviously tons more. There's Bruce Sterling, there's um, whoever wrote Shockwave Rider, and all of that stuff, right? There's more, but William Gibson's Neuromancer is something of a founding text, at least when it comes to novels of cyberpunk, that basically brought cyberpunk to a larger audience. And um, it does unite a lot of these elements. The world, you know, the state system has somewhat broken down, mega corporations have uh, taken over the world, are ruling the world, especially the um, United States have fallen far back into um, all kinds of uh, <laughs> terrible circumstances, while other parts of the world have um, grown in importance for um, William Gibson, that is mostly Japan, 
which is has certainly influenced the um, uh, the cyberpunk aesthetic for a long time. Those um, sort of well, still probably mostly Western looks at Japanese culture in the 1980s, thus being something of a herald before you know the rise, the even further rise of Japanese culture in the West um, in the last couple of decades with mangas and anime and. All that stuff that I have no idea about <laughs> happening. So basically what we usually get in cyberpunk is a world that has fallen apart in all kinds of ways. Staged nation states have crumbled, oftentimes fractured into smaller units. Corporations um, now openly hold sway um, and um, we have as characters usually people that are sort of on the outside, they're sometimes called hustlers, sometimes not, but, you know, they're small-time criminals, mercenaries that try to not knuckle under um, the um, big corporations and try to live on the edges of this um, hyper-capitalist, hyper-corporational um, society. The other part, obviously, is um, a focus on um, data, on information, and versions of the internet. Famously, Neuromancer is one of the first, if not the first, document that uses the word cyberspace. First books, novels that use the word cyberspace, and has certainly had a more than just cultural influence in that regard. Um, we have, obviously, other aspects there, other founding documents, I guess you could call Tron, the original movie one, certainly Ghost in the Shell could be seen as one, and you know, there's there's more out there, but that's basically what you get with Cyberpunk, right? You get um, small-time people standing up to the big corporations that have taken the world by storm. And that's sort of where we can see why Cyberpunk has not aged too well. Because while the rise or the beginnings of late-stage capitalism, um, megacorporations and whatnot, was already visible in the 1980s, we're still looking at the cold, a Cold War time back then. And that is something that usually has, um, you know, vanished um, in those cyberpunk settings for all kinds of reasons. They usually find some. Uh, but the point is... Um, the stuff that looked dystopian in cyberpunk novels, that power of corporations to enforce their will on smaller states, on states that have become weak and so forth, that's sadly become much more real these days, so it doesn't really work as a dystopia anymore. Plus, um, technology often has become very clunky. The, the technology that has that was like super cool and looked very 80s in those cyberpunk Books of the time, right? The, the the decks, the trodes on your head that you force you to go into this into cyberspace. All of those fascinating things, and famously one of the things that um, William Gibson completely ignored or completely uh, yeah, did not include was the idea of mobile phones. So his his internet is a very, <laughs> for all kinds of reason, a fairly <laughs> cable bound, a fairly wired bound affair in a lot of ways, and those other aspects. But you know, so cyberpunk has because it had a very specific nineteen eighties aesthetic in a lot of ways. It feels dated often when you look at you know imagery at the time of the time or while uh, read books of the time. As I said, it, it feels dated. That doesn't mean that its topics and its themes are not still relevant. It just means that we probably have taken those and packaged them into different media nowadays, of course. Um, the other thing that I meant, managed, uh, you know, mentioned, uh, yeah, mentioned was uh, the, the style. Cyberpunk, in a lot of cases, has a style that is distinct from the more ponderous, um, drier, um, science fiction writing of the 60s and 70s in a lot of cases. Your classic sci-fi, your Asimov's, your um, Heinlein's, your um, <laughs> Arthur C. Clarke's, what have you. It is very different in that it introduced a lot of styles from other literary genres to science fiction. A lot of it is very much drenched in like the language of hard-boiled and um, noir crime novels. A lot of, you know... <laughs> A lot of Philip Marlowe is in there, a lot of Raymond Chandler is in there oftentimes, a lot of, you know, 
th those kinds of literary techniques made their way finally into science fiction, which had until then, you know, apart from some exceptions that we obviously have, and y'all are going to go point out uh, in the comments, I hope. Um, but a lot of classic science fiction had stayed away from these techniques of, um, you know, tools, styles, and whatnot of other literary genres for a long time. And um, that certainly um, uh, made cyberpunk very radical. You read stuff like Neuromancer or the, the, the following two books in the Sprawl trilogy, Mona Lisa Overdrive and Count Zero, which are all three also very interesting books to read, and I heartily recommend them, and I even more recommend y'all go and read um, uh, Burning Chrome, the short story collection of William Gibson's as well, because they're fantastic stories, and they <clears throat> they grip you by the throat, and they can be fantastic, but they, they, they certainly differ wildly from what you get in... Um, uh, like older science fiction and have, you know, probably there's very few current cyberpunkish or post-cyberpunkish novels that stayed with that tone. I guess the big one that made a splash like already like 20 years ago, I guess, is Altered Carbon um, by uh, Richard K. Morgan, which very much takes some of those aspects of cyberpunk, the idea of... Um, Economy and capitalism being the driving, the, the evil of the world. Mega corporations, super rich people, and, you know, our main characters being people that operate on the fringe of that and try to stay out of the system in a way. That's something that um, Altered Carbon does replicate in a lot of ways, just transporting it into a now thoroughly um, late-stage capitalist society that we have in the 2000s. So that's sort of where you can see how, where cyberpunk went afterwards, I guess. So we have kind of marked out the territory of cyberpunk as a mostly 1980s aesthetic, um, as something that confronts the evils of capitalism as the big threat of the future. Um, sees a decline of state power in a lot of ways, um, a falling apart of societies of the world that we knew back then, and a rise of technology that is mostly focused on Earth. There is rarely something going on in space. There's always a hint that there's space colonies, but they're usually on the moon or close to the moon or whatever. Orbital, we haven't, you know, necessarily left the solar system in those books. Um, crime plays a huge role. Our characters are usually close to crime, if not criminals themselves, um, and uh, try to survive in that hostile society controlled by crime and mega corporations. Um, so that's sort of what we have in cyberpunk. And as I said, it, it, it's a good idea to read that stuff. It's, it's still fun if you can get beyond the sometimes dated aesthetic. So now let's look at the Marid Odran trilogy and see what Effinger does there. I'll give a short like introduction why y'all should go and read it and then we move into the spoilery parts what I think make the books good and some of the things that maybe make them not so good but they're mostly great. <laughs> so um, what do we do? We have like one of the hallmarks of cyberpunk. We have a first-person narrator who is a small-time hustler, um, criminal, and so forth, um, and telling his story in that ruthless society, and so forth. That's very much a cyberpunk check. There is um, some form of modification technology here. It's In this case, it's chips that you can like slot in to a socket in your brain and then they add skills to you, uh, to your capability or change your personality. That's the cyberpunk element here. They, that, that first step on the way to transhumanism, I guess. <laughs> we have that. We have three of those novels that follow his art through, um, you know, maybe there's growth, maybe there's not, but... <clears throat> sort of case files, almost, of things that are happening. And now we come to the big thing. This is not in Japan. This is somewhere in the Levant. So um, what Effinger does, and I think does uniquely well, is, or not uniquely well, but fairly well for something written in the 80s, is he engages with what we recently uh, talked about, which is uh, the Orient in a lot of ways. And that's part of why I reread them this time. I mean, you 
probably saw that in my weekly update. It's exactly that. It's like I was already thinking about Oriental things and Orientalism. I'm like, let's go check how good he is actually with that and how, how many cliches there are. And that's a unique setting for a sci-fi novel written in the, in the 80s, somewhere in the Levant um, the, the nameless, the, the city is always called just the city, so you can guess where it is probably going to be, and that's um, somewhere there. We don't know. <laughs> um, and he introduces a lot of um, Islamic culture as well, Islam in there, which is a unique feature. And in his world, yeah, in his setting, in his future, the Islamic cultures are the dominant cultures of the world, while the West has failed and broken apart into all kinds of smaller kingdoms. And we follow our main character, Marid Odran, in his own narrative, through cases in mostly a quarter of uh, that city, which is called the Budain, um, which is apparently modeled after the French Quarter in New Orleans, where Effinger lived for a while. And we have a lot of prostitution there, and we have a lot of small-time crime, and a lot of strip clubs, and a lot of hustlers, everyone getting drunk and taking tons of drugs, and uh, trying to survive while the big powers out there um, play their games. That's your basic setting. And there's, you know, the first one is a straight-up detective story, and uh, that's all I'll leave you. Um, Y'all should go and read it. It's written in that noir, Raymond Chandler-esque style of uh, of writing. If you have ever read any of those noir novels, you'll recognize it immediately. And it's, it is written by someone who knows his style and who knows his language. And that alone is worth reading. It's a blast. Go read it. And they're not too long. So I'll wait here for you and then we'll talk about some of the facets that make these books actually really stand out. And made them, in my opinion, age less than, say, Noromancer. So, go and read it, now. You're done? Very good. Let's talk. Great books, right? Um, and there's like two or three main things that I want to look at here. One of them is certainly uh, the setting or Islam or the depiction of Islam and Arabic, Arab culture in the novels. The second one is the normalization or lack thereof of transgender characters, which is a huge point in these stories. And the third one is, um, well, I guess crime and, the, and so forth. And obviously changes in style that we have in these three novels that I think are also mostly well done, but make the last one feel less successful in my opinion. So, where are we? Islam. Now, religion in science fiction is oftentimes a problem, right? Most, most sci-fi writers had a very um, skeptical view on any form of religion. There's a lot of atheism going on, and usually most people in those future settings that we face in science fiction novels are not very religious, if religion is mentioned at all, right? It's usually a holdback and very archaic, and people aren't taking it seriously, or it's just not mentioned at all. So having a setting that is very much dominated by religion, have, has, having every character in the book relate to religion in some form or another, is unique. And I really appreciate that because, you know, I'm always very happy when religion shows up in books because I'm fascinated by this stuff. And I think Effinger does a great job because what he manages to do is to show how religion in a more religious culture and that does not have to be Islam. It's obviously a Muslim culture over there, um, but it could also be Christian. It could any, be any other religion. How religion actually permeates um, permeates um, life in all kinds of small ways for those that believe and for those who don't believe. You have religious holidays. It's like, yeah, we have uh, obviously in the first novel, there's some time uh, that is part of Ramadan and we get how that, you know, shifts uh, the rhythms of life. We have these ideas of going to mosque on Friday or not going on mosque, to mosque on Friday and how that impacts the lives of everyone, even those people who are not going to prayers. It's, and, and I think it's well done in that regard that it is, it is dealt with or faced with respect. It's not ridiculed, not even by um, our main character or narrator who is something of an unbeliever, at least in the beginning. And 
that's that's pretty fantastic for a science fiction novel. The respect and understanding that Effinger brings to religion. Especially when it comes to showing how religion can be, and often is, even like outside of the question of faith, or the question of whether you believe in the existence of God or not. How those rituals, how those rules, how the structures of religion can be a, you know, a help for a lot of struggling people to build their lives around, just doing the rituals to feel better and so forth. And that psychological aspect of religion is something that I think Effinger engages with in a very interesting way because he does not look down on it, on it like a lot of, you know, your your smug atheists go with like, yeah, this is like a crutch for small for small minded people. It's like, no, you know what? <laughs> Sometimes you struggle for, through all kinds of things, and that doesn't have to do anything with your small-mindedness, but maybe it'll help you find your way, or, you know, the, these kind of aspects, which I felt was, once again, well done. We're having a character who's, like, arguing with himself about it. It's like, yeah, you know, of course I'm sort of using the formulae, um the greeting formula, the rituals, and so forth, but I'm not actually believing, but maybe I'll go to the mosque once and talk to, like, priests there and uh, to imams there and do stuff like that. It just, overall, I felt, made gave gave the novel a an additional dimension that a lot of um, science fiction, and especially a lot of cyberpunk, is obviously missing, because we're already in a thoroughly secular, um, secularized um agnostic um, time frame when those books are written, especially um, in the more um, aggressively progressive parts of uh, Anglo-American culture at the time, like the 80s. Um, so having someone pay attention to that, like, you know, that shit's not going to go away. It'll always stay there, even in those parts of society where there are no, like, full-time believers. There will still be people that, uh, people will still be impacted by religion. And I think that's a really good aspect of this series that makes it stand out and probably helped it stay relevant in a lot of ways because, yeah, you know, here we are in 2022 <laughs> and people are still very much religious. So, um, go on for you, George Alec Effinger. Um, all right, let's talk about the transgender thing because I think that that's sort of the one thing that really surprised me because I I kind of had that in my memory when I read it first uh, from like like from when I read it first, but it, it kind of surprised me how prevalent it is. And once again, the first book was released in 1986 or 1987, depending on whom you trust. <laughs> and. Um, Transitioning seems to be a fairly regular thing in this world. And I looked up, uh, I did some very small time research on like how far back, like in that time, how many sci-fi books we have where, where gender or sex, whatever term you want to use, Effinger uses sex, but I think it's mostly a question of, um, of language and how we have changed our language in the last uh, 35 years. Um, point is, when you look back, it's fairly rare. There's not that many science fiction books and stories that deal with questions of gender or gender change, changing your gender or gender identity. Um, there's very little. There's, of course, um, um, The Left Hand of Darkness, which I'll probably have to talk about at some point, <laughs> uh, by Ursula Le Guin from 1969. But beyond that, there's like a bunch of short stories, but not that much. And the way Effinger introduces it, is, <laughs> introduces it has, uh, I think, a very, very positive aspect to it. <laughs> and then there's like the other thing that we obviously also need to talk about, which I think makes a lot of sense when you look at the context of when it was um, written. <laughs> and I'm not saying you have to read things because in the frame of their time. No, no, that's not what I'm, I'm not going to excuse anything here. But let's start with one thing. It's normal. Effinger manage, you know, mentions it from time to time that uh, people had changed their gender and someone was, like one of the characters obviously with Nick, Nikki, who was Crown Prince Nikolai and turns into a, and chain, transitioned into a woman. Um, that's now called Nikki. 
But apart from that, it's very normal, and it goes in both directions. We have trans women, we have trans men in these books. And we have um, even the conflict that apparently, and I'm not an expert on trans issues, and I'd love to have some trans folks actually chime in and tell me more about it, because I'm not the expert here, but I fear... There's very few people who have read these books, unfortunately, so... My quest to find a trans person who has read these books and can give me insight has so far been fruitless. So if you know someone or are interested in joining that discussion and have a background in the trans community, I'd really appreciate your insight. But let's go back. It's very much normalized. It makes a difference between um, those trans people that have done like sur surgery to change their gender and those who haven't. And there may be some looking down on those who haven't. And as far as I know, there are people within the trans community who think the same, but you know, it's all vague. Go inform yourself somewhere else. I'm not, I'm not that person. <clears throat> but apart from that, it is completely normal. And people just talk about it. Yeah, they're women and they use, the, they use the proper pronouns. People that have changed that have transitioned, no matter whether they did like surgery or not, they're all addressed by the proper pronouns, which once again, for 1987, that's pretty cool. <laughs> all of that is, once again, I like the, the way it was just a normal part of the setting. And in that regard, I think <laughs> Effinger and this trilogy is so far ahead of its time. I mean, you probably still get issues <laughs> as a sci-fi writer when you write stuff like that these days. It's probably less, and comes from like a very specific corner of the nerd sphere, but still, I like the fact that it's there. I think it's it's well worth pointing out that someone did that. Now, the negative side, of course, is and that maybe because of the focus that we have here, um, that most, most of the trans people in these books are criminals in some way, or, or crime adjacent, are either prostitutes or criminals. And... I think there's two aspects of that that I think are important. One of them is obviously that as a marginalized group, uh, trans people in the 80s definitely uh, were pushed to those fringes of society that are, once again, and I guess still sometimes are, pushed to those fringes that are, you know, prostitution and crime adjacent. That is still a thing and was even more so a thing in like the 80s in well, all over the world, I guess. So having that part in there is certainly, um, can be seen as an issue because we don't have any or maybe one or two examples, I would need to think about it, of uh, trans people outside the crime sphere. But on the other hand, so much, if not um, basically almost all of these books take place in that criminal area. So we have very few examples of non-criminal characters in these books anyway. So it's probably, on the other hand, kind of could be read as unfair because, yeah, we, we don't see many, <laughs> many upstanding law-abiding citizens in these books to start with. So there's that. But once again... The introduction or the, the inclusion, the inclusion and normalization of trans people in a 35-year-old novel, that's pretty fucking awesome, I think. So yeah, that alone is worth discussing, uh, discussing I think. All right. Um, the setting, the city, the Budain. Um, as I said, it's apparently built on the... <laughs> on the French Quarter in a lot of ways. Um, I have obviously never been there, so I wouldn't know. <clears throat> Beyond that, however, w once one thing that I think Affinger does mostly well is his depiction of the Levant and Arab culture, the, the focus on, you know, rituals and so forth, <clears throat> may be seen as some form of Orientalism if you want. But... I guess the big thing that he does, that he does well, is that he treats every single character as an individual with widely different approaches to culture and so forth. And that is exactly the thing that Orientalism in Said's sense does prohibit, which basically takes away the individuality and the humanity of people living in those areas and replaces them with one fixed image of the Oriental. And Effinger avoids that cleverly. He focuses on certain aspects of Arab culture that I guess he read up a lot on. I'm obviously no expert and can't fully 
and can't double check his um, Arab phrases that he uses there. He looks at the fact that Arab dialects are wildly different and there's no such thing as just Arabic because everyone, every dialect is uh, very, very different. And he looks at those aspects. He looks at the differences between uh, the way people that are, um, you know, coming from more from the Maghreb, like our main character, are sometimes looked down upon by people that come from like a more classical Arab background. He looks at all these... It's fairly nuanced is what I'm saying here, and I, I do appreciate that a lot. The other aspect is, of course, um, that uh, the Burain is a very worldly, multicultural um, uh, metropolitan setting. And that, I think, is another very important aspect, because large cities have always had that. It's like, if you travel across the world, unless you're, like, in very specific places, large cities always have these, like, metropolitan parts that feel more or less the same, no matter where you are. Dep at least that's sort of in my experience, that you always find those places um, where enough riches, enough money and whatnot can buy you things that are not exactly part of the local culture. You can always find those. And that's sort of what the Budain does. But the contrast between that and the city around it, I think, is once again a very well done part. Um, let's look at why, why I think it has aged fairly well as well. And that is, uh, it doesn't rely too much on technology. There is information technology, and he rightly recognized that... <clears throat> Information is the big currency of the future. You're not too hard to predict, but there we are. And having the world basically rule, at least the um, uh, the Muslim world, um, <clears throat> ruled by these two crime lords that <clears throat> help with knowledge in those like fracturing microstates and stuff like that, and thus having the power, so much power over the world. I think is a fairly clever and fairly relevant and fairly good assessment on how the world is developing these days. <laughs> because, you know, states are, you know, have sourced, outsourced information to private companies. And it's just a small step for those to become criminals. So th there's that. And I really appreciate that very much. And I think the final thing that I wanted to look at here today is... Um, the structure. The first one is very much a noir private detective novel, and I like that. He plays, even plays with like these elements with the 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 Mahdi's of you know Nero Wolf and whatnot, and that's that's something I really liked. And he used that language, and then we come to book two, and it's basically a buddy cop story, with Marie being a, forced to be a cop and working together with his partner, and then avenging the death of his partner. That's a very, very specific structure that he used, and I think both work magnificently and showcase different aspects of society, show um, how Marid is trying to adapt to a different life, trying to make his way and keeping his independence in those grinding wheels of society, of a mega corporation, even though the mega corporation in this case is obviously organized crime. And I think that's, that's extremely well done. And the shift in prose is even there to make it more of like a cup or body cup story and that works wonders. The third one, I think, does not land that well. It showcases a lot of interesting aspects of the world, but um, it takes a lot of time with that trip through the desert with the Bedouins and becomes a bit more of a travelogue there. And while the things he showcases there are certainly handled still fairly well for, like, a Westerner writing. I think it kind of almost slips up with that whole murder of the girl that is, you know, murdered by her dad to avoid any future embarrassment. It's... As I said, it's, it's done fairly well, but we're not spending enough time in the Budain, I guess, which is almost a character on its own and a fantastic setting, which is sort of the, the part that was then taken for the source book for... Um, uh, Cyberpunk 2020. So that's, I guess, a bit of a problem there. Although, once again, we see Marie growing. We also see the, the rise of a sort of fascism, uh, culture of fascism there, which I think is a very interesting aspect and showcases a lot of things that um, I feel Effinger was wrestling with. And the idea was like, 
Will there still be nationalism? Will there still be fascism? Of course there will be. And it will be used by people in power who uh, do exactly that. It's like, <laughs> what do you think people like Donald Trump are doing? It's like, <laughs> they're not necessarily fascists themselves, but they're very happy to use those tools to keep the masses going. And in that, case, in that way, it was fairly present again. And I, I do appreciate all of those aspects. I just felt it was a bit weaker as a story overall because we spent too much time in that trip um but overall i liked all three of them on reread they held up marvelously well not like some other books that i read like a decade ago and did a fairly good job when it comes to portraying um uh, arab culture and portraying um or dealing with it i'm obviously no expert there so uh, i don't know but it felt fairly nuanced and um rarely generalized and i think that's a huge part of what makes these books age so well it's it they feel they don't feel embarrassingly old i don't may have to sit here and make excuses for effing journals like oh but he was like you know that was like 30 years ago it's like oh someone writing this book these books today would not get too much flack and i think that's a good sign and i wish more people would read them and maybe if you have read them i very much appreciate uh your comments, your opinions. Did you like them? What do you think of them? <laughs> Have you? Do you think the representation of either trans people or Islam or Arab culture was bad? I very much value all your opinions and insights on that. And beyond that, like, share, subscribe, do all those wonderful things. And thanks for staking with me. Cheers.